thank you, first of all, to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I apologize for having to read this in English. Um, and I will just hop in to it. So if a book was written in Damascus, what was the chance that it would be read in Istanbul? Did people in Belgrade read the works of scholars in Medina? Would an author writing in Turkish in Cairo be read in Erzurum? To pose the question more abstractly, to what degree did the Ottoman Empire function as a unified intellectual or cultural space? And I'd like to exam uh, I would like to examine today how the movement of manuscripts themselves, in particular cheap manuscript pamphlets, created new intellectual spaces, communities, and knowledge. Now, for medieval and early modern Islamic societies, scholars have generally understood intellectual space to be generated out of interpersonal face-to-face -face contact. The ideal process for the transmission of, transmission of knowledge was oral, based upon recitation from memory and conducted in the company of other scholars and students. And to this end, most historians of knowledge in Islamic societies have focused on those spa spaces, institutional or otherwise, such as the madrasa or the college or the majlis, the symposium, that have hosted and validated such interpersonal exchanges. The alternative possibility that an intellectual space could be defined not by its capacity for interpersonal interaction, but by the extent and uh, to and the manner in which objects, in this case, slightly predictably, books, circulated, uh, is only beginning to be explored. And there's two reasons for this state of affairs. Firstly, uh, due to the solidar uh, distrust of solitary visual reading, um, an authoritative community would be expected to sanction the use of certain books through practices like transmission and reading certificates. Secondly, the medium of the manuscript itself, which remained the predominant format of books until the mid to late 19th century, was seen as inherently limiting the ability of books to circulate. So what I'd like to argue today is not only that manuscript books could circulate and be read independently, creating empire-wide intellectual spaces, but that from this, from this unity, geographically dispersed communities began uh, to be defined by the act of reading uh, a shared text or author. And I'd like to broach this topic by looking at manuscript pamphlets, or what I call pamphlets, those cheap, short, polemical works that provided an avenue for new readers to enter the 17th century polemical debates that defined uh, much of the intellectual exchange in the Ottoman Empire. Pamphlets both allowed ideas and controversies to spread across the empire, and they further fueled the polemical atmosphere of the time by the techniques of reading and writing they enabled, such as misattribution and superficial reading. And by challenging earlier medieval reading practices that authorized the text within the con uh, with the consent of a community, pamphlets pushed scholars to elaborate new practices of individual uh, visual reading, mutala, that could create scholarly consensus despite the constant and growing circulation of books. In total, this signaled an important shift. The reading of a text was no longer necessarily sanctioned or authorized by a community, as in the medieval period. Rather, the reverse was true. It was actually the act of reading of a shared text that now created in united communities. So to understand the act of reading in the Ottoman Empire, I think we first need to turn to the materiality and circulation of books themselves. Uh, the history of the book in the early modern Islamic world, unfortunately, has largely been written as a history of failure to adopt print. Uh, an earlier generation of scholars has regarded the printing press as one of the indisputable motors of modernity and change and pointed to religious obscurantism and tradition as the reason behind the Islamic world's uh, abortive adoption of print. Newer scholarship on European book history, for, however, has dismantled the technological determinism uh, imbued in this older view. Instead, it argues that print uh, instead of arguing that print naturally conferred upon a text fixity, circulation, or stability of authorship, these scholars have unearthed the social practices from new methods of reading to market mechanisms that can instill trust and surety in printed, um, in printed books as they spread across Europe. Uh, and this crack in the telos of print provides uh, scholars like me a space in which to explore the practices that allowed the manuscript culture of the early modern Ottoman Empire to flourish and develop rather than regard it as static and unchanging, a lack of print in other words. So instead of seeing manuscripts as inherently inhibiting the circulation of knowledge with their supposedly high cost, limited numbers, and naturally local communities, 
I'd like to direct our attention to those manuscript pamphlets that were cheap, plentiful, and widespread. Um, and this is, in a sense, this is um, an engraving, I think, from uh, Josef van Hammer's History of the Ottoman Empire. And this is a set of manuscripts, in this case, uh, large volume, multi-volume works of history, uh, extremely heavy. And this is, I think, our image of what, uh, for most Ottoman historians, of what the, let's say, the textual remains of all these books are at the moment. But what I'd like to focus on is essentially pamphlets, which were just one subset of cheap books. These short, easily copied, economically priced, and often ephemeral manuscripts that were extremely popular throughout the early modern Ottoman Empire. Uh, other types of cheap books include stories and tales, catechismic texts. But despite the fact that these inexpensive books were the most common type of book, uh, books in circulation, the little, circ uh, little scholarship that exists on the history of manuscripts in the early modern Ottoman Empire and the early modern Islamic world at the large has emphasized elaborate and costly books, often lavishly illustrated with miniatures and produced in palace workshops. So what we're looking at is here, and this is the, today this is, if they're preserved, they're preserved essentially bound together. Uh, and for instance, this piece of a manuscript sticking out is uh, what I'd like to point our attention to. Um, a few, let's say in this case, it's about 10 folios, five, five to 10 folios. Um, the word pamphlet, however, is a peculiar choice given that it's most frequently associated with the advent of cheap printed books. And in the European context, uh, pamphlets are a 17th century development that spread thanks to the ability for the printing press to produce um, many texts at relatively little cost. Yet despite the fact that there does not seem to have been a technological development in manuscript production, I've chosen to use the word pamphlet <coughs> to create some analytical distance and a sense of temporal change. There were internal categories for, the wor uh, for these works. Uh, Abdurrani and Nabulsi, one of the chief pamphleteers of the period, uh, sometimes called his numerous short works ojalas, short, quickly written pieces. Others simply called them rsalas, uh, treatises in the most generic sense. Yet to call them rsala or rsail, uh, or the equivalent translation of epistle or letter or treatise, elide some of the rather drastic changes to reading culture uh, and circulation that occurred since the medieval period for the sake of linguistic continuity. For a new world of cheap books, and far-flung readers, maybe it would be wiser to use the word pamphlet than the risala. Librarians and bibliographers of Middle Eastern manuscripts estimate that there are at least three to four million manuscripts in the Arabic script remaining today in private and public collections, a very large chunk of them which comes from the former lands of the Ottoman Empire. Moreover, moreover as any researcher knows, and as the catalogs likewise reflect, the overwhelming majority of datable manuscripts were produced during the 17th, 18th, and early 19th centuries. Uh, we should not think of these millions of manuscripts as large, heavy medieval tomes, in other words, this, but rather as small, cheap books, one type of which are pamphlets. So let me suggest four criteria by which we can adumbrate a uh, working definition of the manuscript pamphlet. One is that pamphlets were cheap. They were cheap both in terms of the cost of materials and the amount of time required to copy them. In general, they were physically small books and short, ranging from two to 30 folios. Um, they were easily composed or copied in a sitting. Pamphlets likewise lack any ornamentation and often even binding. Uh, two, they were independent texts. They're a small but complete textual world rather than a small selection of a larger text. They include benedictions, prefaces, conclusions, just as any larger text, but of characteristically short length. And this isn't to say that they did not quote other books or respond to them, but one could read them on their own without necessarily requiring knowledge of the previous book. So three, pamphlets provided arguments. In a period when vicious debates about what it meant to be Muslim flared up throughout the empire, uh, pamphlets pr uh, proffered hadiths, that's traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, and choice quotes for aspiring readers and polemicists. Instead of having to buy a whole book and be required to navigate its arguments, logic, disputations, and such, 
pamphlets provided a ready set of references, stories, counterarguments, and examples for instant deployment against one's opponents or for personal reflection. They were part of a growing culture of proof in which ordinary believers were supposed to not only know core beliefs, but also be able to prove them and convert others. And their capacity to short circuit the scholarly apparatus of traditional books and bypass the social etiquette uh, that accompanied them made pam pamphlets especially liberating to their readers and threatening to other scholars. Um, the argumentative aspect of pamphlets also differentiates pamphlets from other, um, from other cheap books that proliferated in the 17th century, such as tales and stories and small books of prayers. Um, and it also makes them different from the European counterparts in that they did not provide news uh, in the literal sense of new information about current events or scandals. Instead, there are texts with uh, much longer shelf life, often copied, read, and circulated for decades, since they addressed a long-standing, uh, they often addressed long-standing legal and social debates, such as the permissibil permissibility of various religious practices, coffee, smoking, land tax issues, merchant morality, and so on. And then four, pamphlets were made to circulate. Not only were they light and small, they were meant to be read by and circulated to a variety of individuals outside of the personal circle of the author. Um, so in this case, for instance, this pamphlet here, uh, it is the work of Abdelghani Nabulsi, a famous Damascene scholar from the late 17th century. It is copied by uh, the grandfather of, a, of an Egyptian historian, Abdurrahman al-Jabarti, uh, and it actually ended up in Medina in a private library, in a small private library that was eventually uh, acquired by, Leid uh, by Brill and when it was moved to light in the early 20th century. So this is just one small example of how these things move around. Um, so unlike other earlier practices of publication that were debuted in gatherings uh, to a small local community, these pamphlets were made to be distributed and spread. And while these texts were most likely discussed and debated in public, um, the fact that there's little variance between the numerous extant copies suggests that they are not orally transmitted and while, or for that matter, continuously um, added on to. And while pamphlets read, re readily circulated, their circulation did not um, rely on market mechanisms. Uh, rather, they're distributed by individuals, which I'll get to in a bit. So now that I've sort of outlined what a pamphlet is or what I'm arguing that a pamphlet is, um, there's the other question of cost. And now one of the most common presumptions about manuscripts in comparison to printed books is that they're extremely expensive and inherently limited both owner, uh, book ownership and readership. The reality though is that manuscripts existed in all price ranges. And as Meredith Quinn has noted, uh, manuscripts in the Ottoman Empire could be as cheap as a rag or as expensive as a house. And from the rough quantitative work on probate records in Cairo, Damascus, and other cities, we gain a partial picture of book ownership um, while probate records provide the clearest quan uh, quantitative data regarding book ownership, we don't really fully understand the social and legal negotiations uh, that resulted in a deceased person's belongings uh, being processed by the court. Despite this, though, there is some useful data that we can extract from this work. Uh, for instance, from Nelly Hanna's figures from the Cairo probate inventories, we can demonstrate that the majority of books were actually quite cheap. Uh, Hanna provides a rough breakdown of price points of the books that were processed and subsequently sold at auction by two of the Cairo probate courts, revealing that the cheapest range of books from one to 30 nisfadi consisted by far the largest group of books. The most expensive books could reach up to 10,000 nisfs, pointing to the vast array of books available on the market. And Hannah mentions that uh, most of the books in the lowest price range were actually between five to 10 nisfs. And she speculates that these were short treatises. And this price range, five to 10 nisfs, I've calculated was about equivalent to two, 200 to 400 grams of coffee uh, in the late 17th century. So all in all, a cheap book was actually cheap and could be bought within a range of daily uh, within the range of daily goods. The percentage of books in this price range seems to have been consistent across the decades, remaining steady across much of the 18th century at around 43 to 48%. Yet this relative stability is belied by the fact that the Egyptian 
in this, in this case, lost uh, nearly half of its value between 1680 to 1780. In other words, the market share of cheap books and pamphlets actually grew in Cairo over the 18th century. And when we expand our inquiry to other major cities of the empire, uh, we find similar results, even though I won't go into this at the moment. So did the ready economic availability of uh, books correspond to growth of new classes of readers? Uh, quite a few scholars have recently suggested that the number of readers actively engaging with written texts did increase. Uh, Derin Terziolu has written uh, about a new group of vernacular readers in her article on catechismic texts, that is, text about uh, basic Muslim belief. And these works were aimed at primarily at were aimed at partially educated readers who could read or write and perhaps recite some verses of the Quran, uh, but had difficulty reading longer, more complicated theological works. And these readers were thought of as a valuable potential audience, one that needed proper guidance lest they turn toward error. Um, one of the major writers of such morality texts, an author who went uh, solely by the name of Nushri, characterized this group of readers as uh, ummi, a word that is usually translated as illiterate, uh, but has a broader range, of me uh, broader range of meanings. It could denote those who had limited fluency in Arabic, uh, in Persian, and in Persian learned discourse, or those who were literate only in Turkish, or who are unable to read in any language. Um, apparently, readers were a common enough occurrence that Nusse constantly exhorts his co-religionists to quote, read, and if unable to read, to listen to a vocal reading of his book. And this isn't an uncommon refrain. A number of contemporary authors set out to create works for those who found it difficult to read, uh, aiming to create texts for the high and the low. And for instance, the chief jurist, uh, Minkari Zadeh, created an abbreviated version of his work on the controversial question of whether a Muslim could call himself one of the people of Abraham, Milet Ibrahim. He reduced an already, already trimmed 15 folio work to one that consisted of two to three folios. To quote, in order that most, in, in order that most people not be fatigued by visually reading it. And as these comments suggest, uh, literacy of various levels was widespread in cities and towns amongst them, among the upper classes and much of the middling classes as well, even though no one's attempted to, uh, let's say, uh, find quantitative figures about levels of literacy. So up to now, I've basically just outlined what I've, uh, definition of pamphlets, tried to show how they were actually the majority, cheap books were the majority of things, circulate, books circulating in this area, um, and as well as the type of new readers that could potentially uh, use them. Now, what I'd like to talk about is essentially the danger of pamphlets. And what made pamphlets danger, dangerous in particular was their capacity to circulate, their capacity to cross both social and geographic space in a highly charged time. Pamphlets in particular bypassed the traditional mechanisms that regulated the interpretation and circulation of texts. In, traditional, in the traditional medieval context, um, a variety of social relations strictly regulated the transmission of knowledge. The earliest Islamic scholars distrusted the technology of the written word. Ideal knowledge was transmitted and received orally, and when written down, it was collected as lecture notes, aid memoirs for future use, and not as proper books. Um, by the ninth century, the codex had been readily accepted as a technology, but its use was often regulated through transmission certificates uh, in which a qualified teacher stated that a specific text could be taught and transmitted by one of his students. Yet even when books became an established technology, consuming them visually was never uh, fully sanctioned as an acceptable form of knowledge transmission. Instead, the memorization and recitation of texts played a key role in, the, in this process of learning uh, and transmission. Students ideally would learn fundamental texts and handbook through memorization, um, building upon skills they developed from years of memorizing first the Quran and then Hadith, that is, the many traditions of the Prophet Muhammad. Their capacity to memorize and recite a text after hearing it once was often valorized in the biographies of famous scholars, 
Um, there's numerous examples of how in the medieval Islamic world the production of books was inseparable from the public recitation and subsequent memorization of, of a work. Damascenes, for instance, were told to avoid private reading of texts and to avoid uh, learning from these scholars who relied upon visually, uh, visual reading uh, rather than reciting it from memory. Now, the alternative to this, uh, the act of individual visual reading, or mutala, or nazar, as, as, as it's also called, has never really been absent from the Islamic context. Uh, since the adoption of the Codex, it's always been practiced, but it was never really sanctioned as an acceptable form of knowledge transmission. And as Huari Tuati explains, uh, quote, Islamic culture of the Middle Ages places books into a paradoxical situation. Although it permits them to be read with the eyes, uh, the term nadra literally means to look at, uh, and the same with mutala, it validates access to their content only by means of an audition, sama, that is through the ears. Now, when visual reading was practiced, it was often by extremely skilled and established scholars or by princes and kings reading histories and poetry. Even in instances where, uh, where reading and book culture expanded to new classes of the population, as Conrad Hirschler demonstrates um, in his work on the popularization of reading, uh, of reading in 13th century Damascus, the act of reading remained bound by oral transmission as exemplified by the practice of issuing reading certificates uh, for a particular text and for members of the audience. So together with transmission certificates, reading certificates ideally guaranteed a proper transmission of both the author's name uh, and text, but also to the degree possible, uh, authorial intention and meaning. All of these practices of knowledge transmission were predicated upon and created for further social bonds that ensured proper transmission of uh, knowledge. The constant repetition and reiteration of interpersonal interaction and teaching and reading and the inscription of a lineage of scholar tra scholarly transmission uh, in the written records that these certificates produced allowed for a community to control the interpretation and dissemination of a text. And for this reason, scholars have traditionally focused uh, their studies on local institutions, such as the madrasa, the college, or Sufi lodges, or princely courts that could establish and facilitate such interactions. Now, as for pamphlets, they're often destructive of these bonds that these local spaces fostered. Uh, first, pamphlets were first pamphlets were pamphleteers expected their audience to read their treatises visually, that is, through mutala. Readers might then deploy them in group settings like coffee houses or mosques, but they did not rely upon the formal approbation of a community uh, for their reading. And because they were largely read alone uh, and due to their brevity, they did not need traditional mechanisms of transmission. And at the same time, uh, for reasons that are still unknown to us, all reading certificates and many, though not all, transmission certificates largely disappear from the manuscript sources of the early modern period. At the same time, pamphlets were argumentative texts. They would often mention a general, the general controversy, allude to the author's position, and then supply various Quranic quotations, uh, hadiths, statements by major classical scholars, uh, and so on that could support the point. And in this sense, they really resembled sermons. They were meant to make a point, supply the proof, and end. And bereft of, the, uh, bereft of logic and rhetoric that accompanied larger scholarly books, pamphlets required much fewer technical skills to read. Uh, to read a pamphlet and otherwise entailed a quick superficial reading. And pamphlets not only encouraged uh, different reading practices, but they also supported, supported types of writing that further inflamed the acrimonious atmosphere of the time, in particular, uh, purposeful misattributions. And if we can gleam an under, glean an understanding of the mechanics of pamphlet circulation by examining one case of this phenomenon. So one day in 1683, uh, Abdurrahman Nabulsi, a major Damascene intellectual and a very prolific pamphleteer who has hundreds of works, uh, received a letter from his correspondent regarding a pamphlet that viciously attacked Ibn Arabi, who was a 13th century Andalusian Sufi mystic, and his admirers, 
supposedly written by the noted 14th century scholar uh, Saad al-Din al-Taftazani. And the correspondent actually requested um, a refutation of the said treatise in order that he could distribute it as a pamphlet. Nabulsi, though, actually refused to engage with the pamphlet or this text in question because he claimed that it was actually purposefully and falsely attributed, otherwise Matsusa, to Taftazani uh, in order to increase its circulation, its rawaj. And Nabulsi's main proof for such a claim was that it did not agree uh, with the statements in Taftazani's other well-known works, in other words, a failure of authorial consistency. Uh, and this failure emerged partially, partially because the treatise had newly arrived at Damascus. He says, we had not heard about it in our lands, that is the Arab provinces, until recently, when a group from the lands of Rum, that is the Turkish-speaking provinces, brought it uh, down with them from uh, Istanbul. Nabulsi then reveals that he'd actually seen the treatise itself from a, quote, loathsome, loathsome man of Arab descent who brought it from the lands of Rum. Finally, Nabulsi argues that the pamphlet style did not match the peerless style of Taftazani. The words were feeble and the expressions were loose. And from this example and those above it, we can see how Nabulsi and his correspondents were actually quite aware that they lived in a world of quickly circulating and far-reaching polemical pamphlets. Manuscripts readily appeared in towns and cities, and it was unclear if they were uh, reliable or trustworthy. The character of the transmitter was of secondary importance to a work's content. Instead, the capacity of a manuscript to circulate de depended on the fame of its author, and astute readers understood that there were unsavory characters out there who would purposely misattribute a manuscript to a famous author to increase its circulation. So to this end, pamphlets seem to have encouraged not only false attributions to major authors of the past, but also to major authors of the day. Take, for example, the corpus of uh, Birgivi Mehmed Effendi, a 16th century author of a very famous text called the Tariq al muhammadiyah or the Muhammadian Path, uh, whose, writers, whose writings became the inspiration for 17th century religious reformers. Uh, as Ahmed Kaila uh, has demonstrated, uh, the corpus of his works began to swell in the 17th century uh, as 30 to 50 new pamphlets were attributed to him. Similarly, the work of Qadizad Mehmed, the man whose uh, name posthumously uh, was attached to the Qadizad movement of fundamental, quote unquote, fundamentalist Islamic reformers in the 17th century, became the attributed author of a number of other people's works. <coughs> Scholars in the 17th and 18th centuries were themselves aware of the great increase in misattributed texts uh, by these followers of Qadizadeh. One of the early, uh, one early 18th century scholar noted that, uh, that these Qadizadehs, these followers of Qadizadeh, became his partisans, worshiping polemics, and they attributed to him what he did not say and did not or, uh, originate from him. Now, Nabulsi's awareness of the mechanics of this quickly flowing manuscript world uh, made him guard and develop his own authorial persona as quickly as he denounced that of others. In another letter, Nabulsi responds to the request from his literary agent in Adirne, a man named Muhammad al Hamidi, to remove, in the process of copying and distribution, controversial statements about tobacco smoking uh, from his commentary on uh, the aforementioned Birgivi's uh, Tariq al Muhammadiyah. Now, Humaydi feared that uh, common readers, incapable of understanding it, might encounter it and reject the text, and thus uh, decrease its circulation, its tadawul. Humaydi's hesitations were not misguided. Only a few decades prior, two authors had penned commentaries on the same work, who had penned commentaries on the same work, had been sentenced to death. And in spite of these concerns, Nabulsi's, uh, Nabulsi rejected the proposition vehemently, stating that one, he never wrote his books to gain worldly fame or position, and it would be an insult to God if he were to retract his work now. And two, that it would contradict similar statements he wrote in, an, um, in a shorter, independent work on tobacco, and otherwise a consistent emphasis on authorial consistency, whether long works or in, across shorter pamphlets. And he asked, that, he asked that his friend change no part of his works and faithfully copy them as he found them. Um, regardless of Nabulsi's claim that he did not care about worldly fame 
uh, and increased circulation, he was actually actively interested in the circulation of his works and wanted them to spread across all levels of society, uh, even to those who might not be able to fully understand them. The danger, though, lurked precisely when Nabulsi's work passed beyond his distributing intermediaries into a world of largely unmediated circulation. Misinterpretation, which could result in censure, even death, was a real possibility, and thus it became paramount to safeguard his authorial reputation. And so for this reason, his distributors, that is his friends, students, and correspondents, aided in the spread of his authorial authority by creating and preserving reliable exemplars of his uh, work copied from and collated against uh, Nabulsi's rough drafts, his musawada, which, at the, uh, which was the truest expression of authorial intent possible at the time. And similarly, Nabulsi and his readers compiled and copied bibliographies of his work to formally establish his corpus. And then even later on, once we get to the hagiographies of him in the 18th century, uh, in some ways, the miracle that defines his sainthood is actually the miracle of authorship the capacity to write so much and to be able to consistently keep it under his name. Um, so now while accretions and forgeries might be regarded as the normal state of affairs in any culture, part of the constant back and forth between forgers and critics, fights over the attribution of texts began to rend apart the textual community uh, of Muslims. It had always been recognized that by scholars that copyist mistakes and, or misattributions were a possibility uh, in the transmission of texts. But this could be resolved through recourse to an authority, whether that of, a, for instance, a sheikh or a famous scholar. So let's return to the above example of the fake Taftazani pamphlet attacking anyone who admired Ibn Arabi. Uh, Nabulsi's correspondent reveals that he not only harbors suspicions regarding the authorship of the pamphlet in question, but also asks whether the works of Ali al-Kari, a respected uh, and prolific early 17th century scholar and pamphleteer in uh, from Mecca, who penned treatises on the same topic, were actually his. And I think this small episode gives us a glimpse as to how suspicions became contagious, undermining the author function of one scholar after another, factionalizing authors based on the content of their work. In a different episode, the observer Kiatab Chalabi remarked, uh, quote, the allegation of Fiqh al-Akbar, which is another work, um, is not the work of Abu Hanifa is false, a product of fanaticism, a simple denial with no foundation. In other words, it was not only symptomatic of the times, but equally corrosive to the notion of a shared textual community and can and the canon of works that underlay it. Uh, readers began to divide themselves according to the texts um, that they, were, they thought were honest and believable and others that they felt were untrustworthy. Um, and part of this was also the transformation as, in, as this intellectual community began to break down, it began to be expressed as ethnic divisions, often uh, between Arabs and Turkish speakers, Arabic speakers and Turkish speakers, and the constant refrain is that um, non-Arabs don't know how to read properly, they don't understand rhetoric and logic. So if this attempt to interpret texts correctly across imperial space, um, led essentially to new techniques of reading is one of the points that I'm arguing here. Um, and this is a set of treatises, a set of, uh, yeah, essentially small treatises about reading theory. And in the 17th century, treatises began to appear that attempted to define an ethics and practice of purely visual reading, adab al mutala um, and their emergence signals an attempt to elevate the practice of visual reading into an acceptable method of knowledge acquisition and transmission. And if no authoritative community could guarantee the stability or proper interpretation of a traveling text, and reading, or rather certain types of reading, increasingly took place outside of the structured and sanctioned oral context of the medieval world, then one uh, solution was to train people to read differently. In other words, scholars needed to give people the tools with which to visually read and analyze texts on their own. And so the most popular of these is this one pamphlet by uh, Hamid bin Burhan al-Ghaffari, who instructs his readers in the proper method of visual reading, mutala. So when you start to visually read, uh, when you start visually reading, read the piece comprehensively from start to finish, 
and your mind extract the desired initial meaning from it. Then observe the conceptual aspects through close analysis and reflect on them. Would some issue that would cause it to be rejected as evidence disprove it? Is it possible to refute it and to refute the refutation? I'll, just, I'll skip the rest of this quote, but the process that Rifari explicates here is a sort of analytical thinking that stems from individual visual reading of a text. Analysis here is defined as, uh, in other places as reading with an eye to the proper vocabulary and semantic context of a work, which would have ideally been reproduced uh, within uh, the oral explanation of a text if it had been read in a group. And this was meant to be a purposefully inculcated skill. It was not a self-evident method of reading. Uh, Ghrifari tells the aspiring visual reader that only after a year or two of practice and many disappointments uh, would it become second nature. But one of the benefits is the ability to challenge the arguments of major scholars, so much so that Ghrifari tells his readers that there's no shame in retracting your reputation of a famous scholar if you feel the need to do so in your heart. And by investing visual reading with this sort of intensive analytical apparatus, uh, Rifari and others like him began to rehabilitate this repu reputation and turned it into a valid method of knowledge acquisition and transmission. Uh, Rifari, however, was not constructing a method of visual reading out of thin air. The emphasis on establishing evidence and counterarguments makes it clear that his reading theory was actually emerged from this thing called disputation theory, a field of knowledge that attempted to lay down the official, official methodology of argument and acceptable evidence. And it's a field of knowledge that essentially, as they, as people in the 17th century knew it, started in the, around the 13th or 14th century. Again, uh, Rifari cautions his audience that, quote, visual reading won't become easy until after you call to mind the foundations of disputation and the laws of debate, and after these foundations and laws become generally accepted amongst people engaged in debate and writing. But having said that, there was actually um, different takes on visual reading. And somewhere around the year 1680, a scholar named Ahmed bin Lutfallah al-Awlawi, or known to Ottomanist as Munajim Basha, the name actually means uh, chief astrologer, copied down the Ghaffari's pamphlet on visual reading in his notebook. And from these notes, uh, he wrote the longest and most thorough explanation of visual reading known to scholars today. Unlike Gafari's text, um, which uh, unlike Gafari's text, um, that was he believed that reading and uh, proper reading would lead to the diffusion of polemical exchanges between scholars. And his main complaint about Gafari and the field of reading ethics in general was that it was too heavily based upon adab al bath or disputation theory. Why he wondered had previously previous generations of scholars expounded upon disputation theory and written so many treatises, yet ignored uh, reading theory. We quote, debate is reliant upon visual reading, and when debate is not preceded by visual reading, then nothing, sa nothing results save quarrels and controversy. Um, and he rejected the, asser the assertion that earlier generations of scholars had neglected explicating it since visual reading was a self-evident and natural act. Um, in a sense, Munajim Basha found Rafari's treatise unable to cure the ill that had resulted in society from quarrels and controversy, in other words, polemics. Uh, so while Munajim Basha's theories and instructions regarding visual reading were the focus of his works, the true novelty of his writing, I would argue, lies in the fact that he implicitly understood that reading, even when conducted alone, was always a social act. And this was the reasoning behind his attempts to break free of a theory of visual reading uh, to break free the theory of visual reading from its background in disputation theory and give the field a uh, disciplinary foundation of its own. Um, in Munach in Munachim Basha's writings, we actually see a rather dramatic shift uh, has occurred in comparison to the medieval ideal. It was proper reading that now led to a proper harmonious community rather than the other way around. He believed that with precise training and the correct method of visual uh, individual reading, scholars would begin to engage in new, more civil uh, form of intellectual exchange. He called this muzakara, discussion, uh, most generically translated, which fell under the realm of the ethics of reading as compared to debate or munadhara, which belonged to disputation theory. Uh, structurally, there weren't really 
radically different. Discussion reprised the roles of claimant and questioner, uh, and the different objections to the admission and capacity of proofs found in disputation theory. But Munajim Basha does found debate too polarizing, too acrimonious to achieve true scholarly interaction. Um, and for him, the point was not to best the uh, other opponent or simply force them into admitting that they could uh, not support their position. Instead, he wanted to create a sort of scholarly consensus around a text. And when Munajim Basha outlines the ethics of discussion, he warns others, he warns that another one of the conditions is that the group like one another, even love one another, and not brutally hate each other, because love requires paying close attention, and that requires an uh, understanding of intended meaning, just as hatred requires the opposite. So this appeal to love your neighbor through reading properly um, are somewhat generic, but I think that they attempt to dismantle a deeply polarized atmosphere, one in which polemic and invective had split apart a community of texts and authors. Um, so the new civility of discussion, muzakara, or at least claims to such, had to follow the prioritization of visual reading. Had to follow it, really. The visual, new visual reading put forth by scholars like Munajim Basha and others sanctioned the extraction of textual meaning through individual visual reading of text by providing the tools for the proper interpretation of a text according to the semantic and terminological context with an eye to its logical and rhetorical aspects. And while this would ideally guide a properly trained reader to the same interpretation of a, of a text as others, readers would inevitably return with multiple interpretations. Discussion, then, was a means to resolve these varied interpretations and create a consensus by engaging with other scholars. In Munajim Basha's treatise, the relationship between the group uh, and reading had come full circle. For the, attendings of, for the attendees of a late medieval uh, Damascus reading group, for instance, the group guaranteed and sanctioned the reading and the stability of a text. In Munajim Basha's uh, Mudakara, or discussion, it was the act of proper reading and discussion that guaranteed a group stability. So Munajim Basha's words, in other words, point to the new realities of books and their circulation uh, that were taking hold in the 17th century Ottoman Empire, and that these changes should take place in a manuscript culture, one that's entirely a manuscript culture, should make us rethink precisely uh, which unique qualities and causative powers we wish to endow to print in the European or East Asian context. Thank you.